I'm here for two reasons. One, I'm very gracious of the treatment that I've had. And I really want to reach out to people and let them know that uh, about this type of treatment and how well it's worked for me. Um, I didn't, I'm, I'm outclassed clearly with these guys. I'm, I'm simply a patient who's done very well with this uh, therapy. And, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't prepare an outline or any of that kind of stuff. I just always kind of gone by uh, Mark Twain's old saying, which was, uh, tell them the truth and you don't have to remember anything. And uh, so it's, uh, I, I'm only one year since I've been diagnosed, since I was diagnosed with this. So the memories are fairly recent for me. And so there's not a ton for me to like scan back in my distant memory to try to remember, thank God, because uh, <laughs> that might be difficult. I can tell you a little bit about myself for the people that don't know me at all or what I do. I'm the drummer for the rock band Poison. I started the band 30 years ago with Brett Michaels, and uh, I've been touring pretty much all my life, making records, videos, and that kind of stuff. I waited a little bit later in life to get married and have, a, have children, and uh, I thought I would be better prepared for that. I wasn't prepared for cancer to enter my life at a later point in time. Uh, so, you know, that, that took a little bit of a toll mentally. But uh, let me just ask a, a question really quickly. Who here has or has had cancer? Well, it's quite a bit of, quite a few people. And who, who are students here? Oncology students or med students? Okay, so most of you are here because you're curious about this therapy. And uh, by the way, I'll probably take frequent drinks because I did have radiation and uh, I don't have a whole lot of saliva anymore. So, um, so my journey kind of began last year, close to this time. Uh, I was, uh, I think it was July actually. Uh, June, late June, early July, and my whole family had a sore throat. I wasn't that concerned about it. I went to the doctor. He gave me antibiotics. I came back a couple weeks later, and I said, Doc, the antibiotics are not working. Uh, and I said, I've got a lymph node that's really jumping out here, and I've, I've had little lymph nodes, but this one, so he took a look, and he felt it, and he goes, yeah, it is a little concerning. Now, thank God he was an ENT as well. And uh, his name was Dr. Friedman. And he said, I would like to scope you. And I said, what is that? He goes, I numb you up and I stick this thing down your nose. And I said, does it hurt? He said, man, not really. Uh, he said, but I can get a better idea and see if there's a secondary infection going on or what might be going on. So with that, he numbed me up and went down, took a look, sat down, took his glasses off. And he said, uh, listen, he said, I think we need to do a biopsy. I see some tissue at the base of your tongue that shouldn't be there. And I'm concerned that it could be cancer. I'm not saying it is, but we need to do a biopsy. And I said, so my day from just going in to get antibiotics and leave uh, went from that to a possible cancer diagnosis. So I go to a different part of that uh, facility that I'd never been in, speaking with different people who are preparing me for a biopsy, which is very scary stuff. And, and let me say this before I go any further. All you pan cancer patients know that fear is the cornerstone of cancer. It is. It's probably one of the most prolific things about having cancer. But that's OK. It's like the UFC Hall of Fame fighter Randy Couture said when somebody asked him, are you scared when you walk into the octagon? And he said, if you don't have fear, you are not a fighter. So to have fear is fine, OK? So that fear went up in me, huge. I was like texting everybody, oh my gosh. I'm like, you know. He said he has to go down my throat and get a little bit of uh, material from my tongue, knock me out, put me in a hospital, it shouldn't take too long. So they did that and it came back and the frozen sections, which are preliminary tests, came back negative. And he said, we're gonna have to wait until Tuesday at least and see what the FNA results are, which are the more conclusive ones. He called me on a Tuesday night and he said, I don't see any, There's, it's coming back inconclusive. Uh, but I'm just not convinced. I don't feel good about this. I would like to biopsy your, uh, the, your lymph node as well, maybe. Let's put you on some more antibiotics and see if it goes away. It didn't. 
We did the biopsy on the lymph node, uh, which hurt more than the tongue for some reason. And uh, that came back inconclusive. Uh, so being the good doctor that Dr. Friedman is, he said, I have a colleague at USC I would like you to see. He's a surgeon. His name's Dr. Cocott. He's seen this a lot. And if, uh, if anyone knows what it is, he's going to know what it is. And uh, so with that, he sent me over to USC, which I went in that waiting room. And there was a ton of head and neck cancer patients who uh, it was really scary to look at, quite honestly. And I'm not going to get into the morbid details of it, but I thought, I, I, I really don't want to be that guy. And uh, so Dr. Cocott took a look, and he said, I think it's one of two cancers. I think it's either squamous cell carcinoma or a lymphoma. Um, but I have to do a biopsy to know. And if it isn't cancer, then we need to know what that is, too. But I've seen enough of it. I think that's probably what it is. So I went out of there with kind of a half of a diagnosis, sort of. And again, that fear comes up, because it's fear of the unknown. I mean, that's we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what. Any of us could have cancer that's going to kill us. We don't know that. But when you actually are staring it in the face, it's, it's a, it, it goes to a different level. So he ordered up a biopsy. We went in, did the biopsy. About two or three days later, I went out and did a couple of shows with a friend of mine. Plays acoustic guitar. We did an acoustic show. About two hours before I went on stage, Dr. Cocock calls me. He goes, I'm sorry to tell you, but you do have squamous cell carcinoma. We're going to get it handled. There's a few ways we can go about it, and I'll talk to you about that when you come in. And uh, so uh, it was an interesting weekend for me to go smile at everybody and try to have a good time playing shows. Uh, let's rock. I have cancer, you know. So, uh, <laughs> so I went back, and, uh, and uh, he told me what my options were, which were surgery, uh, or radiation, chemo, or a combination of all of them. And most of the people that I had known that I spoke to about head and neck cancer, like mine, uh, was a radiation and chemo. And the people that I knew that had head and neck cancer, like mine, were also HPV positive. And I thought to myself, I've got a 50-50 shot. I don't smoke anymore. I quit 14 years ago, but I did smoke. And I've been with a lot of girls being in the band that I've been in for the last 30 years. I'm not going to lie. I've, uh, I've been a carny traveling around the world. So we didn't know. They said, we'll test it and we'll find out. If you have HPV, you actually have a better chance, really. To, it seems to work a little bit better. And uh, so I went and saw an oncologist. And he said, you know, uh, there's a couple things we can do. We can do a platinum-based chemo. There is something called cetuximab. And you might know that as the drug that, uh, uh, who was the lady that was, uh, got arrested for Martha Stewart, Martha Stewart, who did the insider trading with, the drug, with that drug company. But actually, it turned out to be a, a pretty wonderful drug. It's a very targeted drug. So we said, well, let's do that one, because I'm already 50% deaf. If I do a platinum-based chemo, I'm going to completely be deaf. You know, I've been playing drums all my life. Please, I don't want that. And I've heard horrible things about chemo. So head and neck cancer, when you do, you do chemo of some kind, and you do therapy, uh, radiation therapy at the same time. It's that double whammy that is very difficult to get through. And he said, what are you doing for the next three months? Because this needs to be your job. I said, OK. And he explained how it would go. He said, by about week three, you'll be OK. By week four, the wheels are going to start to come off, and you're going to have sore throats, and it's going to be sick, and it's going to be hard to eat. And if you lose too much weight, you're going to need a feeding tube. And by week seven, you'll be done. But then the next week, it's still going to be difficult. You know, It's going to be three months before you start to even get back to normal. It's going to be six months to a year before you're really even close to normal again. This wasn't fun stuff to hear. Um, but I said, you know what? OK, this is what we're going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build myself a little team. And I am going to treat it like a job. And so I said, I'm going to get a personal trainer. Because I've been doing jujitsu for 16 years. And he said, you've got to stay off the mat. It's too dirty. Can't risk infection. I said, I'm going to get a personal trainer so I don't have to touch anything. I'm going to get a therapist because I'm not right up here from a cancer diagnosis. I mean, quite honestly, this is 
you know, I'm not embarrassed to tell you, I need a little bit of psychological uplift from that. I don't do drugs, by the way. I never have. I know I look like I may have, but I don't. <laughs> All right? In fact, I was having this conversation with Dr. Patel earlier uh, that uh, uh, I was actually an EMT back in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where I'm from. And I saw so many drug overdoses that during the 80s, I just didn't want to be one of the drug overdoses. So I, I looked the part, but I didn't do it. So anyway, so I took that job seriously. Uh, I got a, uh, a swallow therapist on board. I just wanted to fill every single day with something that I would do positive for myself. And then I hired a nutritionist, and I said, I'm going to use you as long as I can, as long as I can swallow. I'm going to get there as, I'm going to come in as high as I can. And if it knocks me down, then okay. But at least I started up here. I don't want to come in here and land down here. So every day I'd get up, and I'd take a shower, and I'd get dressed, and I'd dry my hair, and I'd dress. I mean, I, I don't wear a three-piece suit, but I would at least look like this to go into radiation because I thought, this is my job, and I, I want to feel good about going into this, and if I feel good I'll, about myself, I, maybe I can get through this a little bit better. So that's what I did the whole way through, and I hit that third week mark, and I got a sinus infection. And then it just really started a whole whirlwind of problems. Uh, although I aced most of the radiation and the chemo part of it, I, it produces, uh, that type of uh, chemo produces um, like pockmar. It looks like a, a acne, quite frankly. And it's itchy. And, but I, I didn't get it so bad. I didn't get big radiation marks all over my neck. I did pretty good with that. But I got sores in my mouth. And I think I had 12 canker sores at one point, And I couldn't swallow. And, uh, and I refused to get on a feeding tube. So I just made myself these big shakes every day. And I would get this magic mouthwash stuff that the doctor made up for me. And I'd gargle with it. And then I'd do my shake. And I'd pound that down. And then I'd flush it with water. And then I'd flush it with salt water. And then I'd do the salt water and, and baking soda rinse, and then I'd go back to my magic mouthwash. I had all these cups set up, and I would do that five times a day because I wanted to keep my calories up. I was not going to get a feeding too. I didn't want this thing sticking out. I just didn't want it. Um, there's, I have friends that did have them, but I, for me, I didn't want that. I wanted to keep working out. And my trainer told me, he said, listen, he said, I see that you're going down a little bit. He said, if you're going to call me and tell me that you're not coming in, I'm going to tell you that you need to come in here and if you don't work out, we're going to walk around the gym. You don't have to know anything. Just walk around the gym. We'll talk for an hour. It's okay. I hit that day. I hit that day where I couldn't do anything but walk in the gym. And he said, why don't you just, we'll walk that way, we'll walk that way. Why don't you sit on that bike? And I said, okay. Since you're sitting, why don't you pedal it? I pedaled it. And then he goes, you know, there's that little step up. Just do the step up and then go back on the bike. And then that's it. And then walk around the gym. By the time I was done, I had done a complete workout. And it was, a lot of it was up here. I just thought I couldn't go any further, but I did. So I finally finished all my treatment. Doctors thought I was doing really, really well. I had good doctors, caring doctors. Dr. Neva, who was my oncologist, is a very intelligent guy. I think he cared. Anytime I sent him an email, I got a reply in an hour. Um, I went for, I had to wait for, as you know, many of you know, when you do head and neck cancer and you do radiation, you have to wait for three months because of the swelling. So if your cancer is growing, you don't know it. Because if they do a CT or a PET scan, they can't tell. There's so much swelling in there, you can't tell what's cancer and what's swelling. Let me show you what a radiation mask looks like if you haven't seen one. I haven't looked at this, my wonderful assistant. And so they make these things up, and they mold it to your face. And every day, for seven weeks, you go in, and they, I don't even want to put it in my face. They click this thing on your face to a table, snap these in. You can't move a muscle. Has anyone been through this? OK. So you know. It's no fun. If you're claustrophobic, you really have a problem. Thank God I had jiu-jitsu. I'm used to 250-pound Brazilians trying to choke me out, so I just went there and thought, I, I can do this. It's plastic. 
still that little bit of anxiety comes up. So I got through all that. I waited the three months. But at, that first, at the end of that first four weeks, I started to get lymphedema. I started to get this puffiness. And then I could feel these lymph nodes. Well, the, lymph, the lymphedema is pushing the lymph nodes up. Maybe, maybe not. And I just had to live with this. And I'm like, I'm, then it got five weeks away from the scan. And I'll just tough it out. So I got to that scan day, and I was thinking, I have lymphedema, I have radiation, fibrosis, I have all this, it's all this stuff. It's probably normal. We did the scan. Lo and behold, it wasn't just my primary and this lymph node. Now we have my primary, this lymph node, this lymph node, and two tumors coming up the side of my tongue towards the tip. Doctors said, we don't believe that it's in the tip. We think that maybe you moved your tongue during the PET. But we'll do an MRI, we'll see. They did an MRI, and they said, I'm sorry to tell you, it's up the tip of your tongue. If we do surgery, we're going to have to take your whole tongue out, and you will be a mute. You will most likely be on a feeding tube for life, maybe. Maybe you can get past it. You might be able to eat. You might not be able to eat. You could be bedridden, maybe not. You will have difficulty speaking. You might have to speak with a stoma type situation. And I wouldn't wish this on anybody. That's what the doctor told me. And I said, there's got to be another way. So, well, if we do chemo, it, co it comes back usually. You get three months. I can pretty much guarantee shrinkage, but maybe we can get it down to a point we can do better surgery, but then it's harder to recover. There's all these choices. I said, but. There is one thing, it's called immunotherapy. And you might want to talk to Dr. Neeva about that. So of course I raced down to Dr. Neeva. You have to give me an appointment right now. Let's talk about immunotherapy. And Dr. Neeva said, yes, I have a three-armed trial right now, but I can't guarantee what part of the trial you get in. Maybe you'll have standard of care. Maybe you'll have one drug. Maybe you'll have two drugs. I, I can't do anything about that. And it's going to be three weeks before you, we could even possibly get you on the trial. And your cancer could get worse. And if it gets worse, it could be inoperable. But I do think you have a little bit of time. And I said, is there anywhere I could for sure get on a trial? He said, I have a friend in San Diego, Dr. Cohen. And if I were you, I'd go see him if he could take your appointment. I said, would you be good enough to reach out to him? He said, absolutely. So I made little brown spots in my pants and hauled down as fast as I could. Within two days, Dr. Cohen came in just to see me on a day that he doesn't come in, into clinic. And uh, he was very nice, explained everything, was very hopeful, but also cautioned me that it's, we don't know, we're not sure. But I do think you have some time, and I think we, we can do this. But you have to get some testing. OK. So uh, I said, let's do the testing. Uh, I planned, I said, well, next week I'm going to Disneyland with my little girl. It's her birthday. Uh, maybe I can come down and get the testing right after that. Maybe you can. So they put Tony Lee, who is a wonderful guy, by the way. They put him on my case. And he's a, uh, the guy that's the coordinator for the, for the trial. And Dr. Cohen called me Monday night. We were at the Disneyland Hotel, and he said, listen, I have not such great news. I can't get you on the trial. And the reason is is because you're, are on, you were not on a platinum-based chemo. You were on cetuximab. And I said, but Dr. Cohen, I, if I would have been on platinum-based chemo, I would have been completely deaf. I, I can't do that. I couldn't work. Even if I did live, I couldn't work again. And he said, I understand. Um, let me look around. Let me reach out a few different places. We'll do what we can. We talked about 45 minutes, I think, that night. And I thought, tomorrow morning, I got to get up with my little girl and wish her a happy birthday. How am I going to do this? Next day, that's exactly what I did. We're getting her dressed up like a little princess. And I get the call from him saying, I talked to the drug company. They're going to make an exception. So my day got really better. Not 100% because you don't know, but it sure was a lot better than I was 12 hours before that. Okay, 
There's been three times, and I'm not a religious man, but there's been three times in my life where I've reached out to God, and this was one of those times. Okay? The other three times, I, I won't bore you with the details. But I did. And my prayers got answered. For whatever reason in the universe, it came together. And I left my family behind at 8 o'clock that night after Lucy was falling asleep in her little seat. And I came down here and stayed for a week and got all the tests. And I passed all the tests. The following week, I started on immunotherapy. The first night, I called Dr. Cohen and I said, I don't know what's going on. My tongue feels like somebody inflated a raft in it. I mean, it's huge, and I'm scared I'm not going to be able to swallow. What do I do? And I'm thinking I'm going to have to go get an, in, an intubation tube or something. I mean, I didn't know what to do. He said, no, 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 this is fantastic. That means you're responding. <laughs> I might be responding, but I'm scared to death right now. He said, please, just try to hang in there a couple of days. And let me know if it gets worse. And if it is emergency, of course, let me know that. But I, I, think, I think this is good. I think this could be very good. I think that over the next six weeks, my throat from the biopsies, I had swelling. I had soreness. I was back to my magic mouthwash. I was back to not eating again. I'm back to shakes. I'm all this stuff over that six-week period. But then it started to come up a little bit slowly. And for some reason, at about the six-week mark, it's interesting. I started to, and I don't mean to be graphic, but I started to spit. And I mean, when I was spitting, it was big hunks of I don't know what the heck it was. To this day, I don't know. We only hypothesize about what it was. I'm spitting all this stuff out of my mouth. So week nine, every nine weeks, you get infusion every three weeks. Every nine weeks, you get PET CT MRI. We're nine weeks in. I get my first scan. I'm scared to death. I still have some pain. And then it said, you're about 90% eradicated. And everything had changed. So we celebrated. And uh, my lovely girlfriend, TC, I could not. No way could I have gotten through some of those nights of anxiety and stuff that I got through without her. She was just unbelievable rock for me. So then we won another nine weeks. Of course, we stayed on the trial. It's working. And sometimes with immunotherapy, it can hit a point and stop working. It can go backwards. So of course, my anxiety, I scanxiety. We all have that if we've had cancer and you've had scans. You know what that's like. I have a scan coming up in another four weeks. I'm going to be scared. But we had that scan, and that's when I got the best news of my life, that it was absolutely all gone, every bit of it. Every bit of it. We did a circulating cell test. Circulating tests came back zero. At this time, I have no cancer in my body right now. I always joke, we always, all of us, I think, joke about different things. And we say, like, oh, so what? Just do it. It's not like you're curing cancer or something. You know, you, you've heard that expression. Well, these guys actually are. Now, I, I'm not cured, but I, I'm in remission. And I'm confident that, I will, that this will be cured. I just feel that. Not because I just want it to be, OK? Or not because I just am thinking positively. But because the numbers are starting to show that, literally, especially with the kind of cancer I have. It's like if, if somebody has 100% remission, they usually stay that. It's a very durable therapy. And of course, I'm hoping for that. I could come up here and, you know, a year from now and go, guess what? It didn't work. But I, 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 think, I think we're in a good place. Um, I know for a fact that it saved my tongue and it has saved my life, flat out. Because even if they would have taken everything out, it may have come back in a year, two years, three years. Now I'm a guy that's going to die, and I haven't had my tongue for three years. How much fun is that? You know, um, I mean, I was getting ready to make videos of me talking to my kids about the most important things in life, just so they'd have something with me speaking to them, instead of 
tapping it out on an iPad or writing it down. I wanted them to hear Daddy talk. I'm here. I, they're going to hear Daddy talk. I can talk. I'm fine. And it's because of the promise of immunotherapy. Not just the promise, but it is working. And they, this, is this is a game changer. This is a flippin' game changer, guys. And all of you that do have cancer right now that are scared, I can tell you this. Nobody up here is going to tell you, oh, we're going to cure you. But I can tell you this. You have more hope than you've ever had with this therapy. I, I, I can absolutely, unequivocally say I don't do this for a living. Uh, I can tell you that without a doubt. And I'm very happy to be this guy who's just a drummer in a rock band to be able to come up here and say to everybody, wow, you have hope with cancer. I am outclassed. And this isn't what I do. But suddenly, it's been bestowed upon me. So if God said, I'm going to cure you, and again, I'm not particularly a religious man, OK? But if God said, I'm going to get you into remission, then you've got to do something. And I have no problem doing that. Not one. I, I'm so glad that all of you came out to hear these brilliant minds speak about what's going on with cancer today, because we are in a very good place. And it's just going to get better and better and better. But we need people to keep pushing, keep pushing. If you knock, if you hit on that brick wall long enough, it falls down. And that's, that's what we're doing. Thank you so much for letting me share my story. This I'm going to leave here, and what I'm hoping is that we can auction this off <laughs> and raise a little money in any way that you guys see fit. We might get $5 for it, or we might get half a million. We don't know. <laughs> I never want to see it again. <laughs> We're happy to take Thanks that on. Thanks for your time.